Welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 373, featuring Judith Crow, Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at Side Effects, and very excited to have her on. She is an absolutely amazing person who I've actually wanted to chat with for years, uh, and I don't know, somehow we kind of missed each other, and it wasn't until I went to the VES Awards uh, an X-ray introduced me to her, and I was like, "Oh my God, I've always wanted to meet you." And she says, "I've heard, you know." So it was really great to sort of catch up with her and talk to her, and and just really, she's a very, very impressive person. I'm again very, very important per- person, especially in the world of visual effects. Kristen, what did you think of Judith? Yeah, well, she has like a great story. She grew up in England, and then how yep. she found her way into visual effects, um, where she started off at DD, where you two actually never met the whole time you were both there. Um, yeah. But her favorite projects, she said she worked on, were like Apollo 13. She loved um, uh-huh. Titanic, where she was the digital effects soup on the film, yep. um, and Fight Club. I think she said she liked the beginning the sequence. The opening sequence that through the brain, big, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, and then she kind of left uh, production side a little bit when she had a baby, just to a little less stressful position. Um, mm-hmm. And that's where she moved on to side effects, where she's been at for 19 years now. Um, mm-hmm. Talks about that. And then you guys talk about Houdini and Solaris and kind of what they are doing with it at side effects. Um, and she talks about how they make the USD uh, native into Houdini. So, yeah, a lot yeah. of great info. A lot of great info. And Judith, as you said, is a really cool person and she does incredible work um, uh, at Side Effects and definitely fascinated. She really, really knows the product very well, which is great because she's been there for 19 years. I do want to note that after we finish recording, she goes, oh, we never talked about SIGGRAPH. And we should, I should mention that Judith is a, was a, is still you know very very important person and, and with her contributions to SIGGRAPH, uh, and she's been doing that for years and years, and so it's really sort of you know want to note that that she's like very important in that area as well. So it was really great uh, to talk to her. Maybe she, we'll have her on another time and we can talk more about SIGGRAPH as well. So it'd be cool to do that. All right, Kristen, if uh, we have a couple of events coming up, what's happening? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you can find these at chaos.com slash events. On May 4th, Chaos will be at FMX 2022. Um, and they, Chaos will host a panel discussion on the challenges of creating high-end VFX for episodic TV. Um, and they'll discuss challenges of new technical technological trends, um, cover uh, increasing demand for content on streaming devices, um, services, sorry, and then kind of remote work and just just a bunch of awesome things um, yeah. and how to use virtual production to hit tight deadlines. So be sure to register for that online at chaos.com yeah. slash events. That'll be really mm-hmm. great. I think a couple of my buddies are going to be on the panel. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to be there, but it'll be great to see Chris Smallfeld will be there. And there's a couple other people that will be there as well. So it'll be really cool. And then we have another thing happening on May 18th. What's going on? Yep, we have a Chaos Vantage live webinar. So you can join Chaos's Simeon and uh, 3D artist and Andrea Pedrati, if I did say that correctly, uh, the creator of uh, Spectrum, who will talk about cars, craft, and creati- creativity with Chaos Vantage. So that's May 18th. Perfect. And people can find out all of this stuff at chaos.com slash events. And remember to register all for all those events up there. Uh, we don't have any uh, other product announcements. Uh, we announced Corona or earlier, so you guys should check it out if you want to know more about Corona 8, which we're very excited about. But if people want to know more about the podcast, where can they go, Kristen? You can go to facebook.com slash Podcast or chaos.com slash Garage. And if you'd like to watch us, go to youtube.com slash chaosgrouptv. Perfect. And if you guys have any other ideas of podcasts or uh, or any comments or any suggestions, just email us. Labs at chaosgroup.com is the best place to do it. Or I think it's labs at chaos.com now, actually. <laughs> We've yeah. changed our email. <laughs> so it's just chaos.com now. Uh, all right. Uh, and if, of course, if you have any other, uh, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That's also very helpful. Uh, but besides that, please enjoy episode number 373 with Judith Crow from Side Effects. Welcome to another CG Garage, where the chaos group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays 
In high dynamic range, we know that ambient occlusion is passé. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while. You have a fascinating career. We've known, I've known of all of your amazing work for a long, long time. And I don't think we, I don't think we actually met in person until the VES Awards. Is that true? That think? I think is true, which is pretty right. amazing. I know we've had some close calls over the years and we yeah. obviously know a lot of people in common. But yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. it was I met you back when we were out into the world again, actually meeting people in person. It was Yeah, a, it was nice being it was at a the delightful VS. event. <laughs> yeah. It was definitely very nice to see people again. I think I was with X ray or you were with X ray, uh, and so that's how how we connected, exactly. which was great. Yes. So I'm very happy to uh, uh, do this. Uh, I don't know if you have you heard some of these podcasts before. Well, you know, I hadn't before I met you, but I, I I have to admit, since then I've gone back and listened to quite a few, and a number of my number of my friends are on there. I was listening to the one with Matthew Butler and Kelly Port. Yeah, that was most enjoyable. Um, and I listened to the one with X Ray, which I felt was only polite since he introduced the two of us. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, and a couple of other ones. It's it's, it's a it's a lot of fun. I just hope I can deliver to the same standard oh, uh, as the other I, ones. I am, I, am, I am positive that you will, which is very exciting. But I think what would be great, as obviously, as you know, I try to go through a little bit of a backstory and find out how people got to the journey that they've, uh, they've been on. So I'd love to learn a little bit about you and how you got into computer graphics and what were some of the things that sort of drove that, 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 that fascination that you have. Right, right. <laughs> well, we have to go back a long way into the last okay. century. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up thinking about computer graphics or movies or any of that. I mean, I grew up in the, in the northwest of England, and uh, those just weren't things that were options, really. I mean, I, I, I suppose in school, I, I thought about being a medical illustrator, and then I. I, I dabbled in taxidermy, um, and then I thought it might be nice to find a, a cure for cancer. <laughs> right. But eventually, I went. I went off to art college, and, and um, uh, my my bachelor's was in art and design in social contexts and mm -hmm. contemporary cultural studies. And it, you know, it turned out that really neither one of those uh, qualifications was much good at getting me a job. <laughs> okay. I, I actually graduated um, in. 1983 and in the worst unemployment that Britain had seen for decades in the middle of right. Thatcher's Britain and all of that. So, so anyway, with, with those sorts of qualifications, um, I really just had to start volunteering for the jobs that I wanted to do until they materialized as actual jobs. So I spent four years working in various community arts projects, doing a lot of photography curation. I, I ended up working as a curator in a photography gallery. Um, and so computers were just were just showing up in my life at that point, just as as accessories to get the job done. You know, right. exciting things like how to manage a mailing list at the gallery. But <laughs> yep. I was also also really aware that that the nature of photography was going to change. Um, you know, there was a lot, a lot of talk about the, the 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 essential truth of a photograph would no longer be possible once you could digitally alter photographs. Who who would know what was true anymore? Who would know what was the, was was the, the the basic reality of any given situation? And there was an awful lot of sort of big brother kind of talk in community arts. You know that all the power was going to be in the hands of governments and big corporations. And I was kind of frustrated by all of that. And I just thought, well, I, I want to understand these computer things a bit better myself. What happens if you get this in the hands of, of artists and hands of ordinary people? And there was a new master's program starting up at Middlesex Polytechnic, as it was at the time, um, in computing and design. And it was designed for people from an arts background who wanted to learn how to program. Okay. And it was just the right time in my life to make a change in direction for, for a whole variety of reasons. So I applied for it. And they said, well, how, how good are your math skills? And I said, I think they're fine. <laughs> you know, I was, I just <laughs> thought, I don't know why they ask me all these things. And so I got a place, which was great. So there were 10 of us. It was a tiny little 
tiny program. There were two women in it. <laughs> wow. And uh, it was extraordinary. I mean, it, the, the minute I got in it, all my highfalutin academic kind of ideas about why I was there flew out the window because I just loved to code. <laughs> <laughs> I just found out that there was nothing more delightful than spending 12 hours a day writing something in Pascal and, and later in C and um, and making, you know, writing really hide hideously slow image processing routines on a space ward supernova right. <laughs> or doing vector drawings on a, on a Vax 11, 750. And, and so, you see, know, I spent a, a a year learning all the fundamentals of computer graphics and it was just a joy it's like it opened up part of my brain that had been dormant and and i it, you know in the end it wasn't really the, the the coding part that was the part that was dormant but it was about it was about seeing a pattern to solving certain kinds of problems and and then thinking in a certain way breaking down problems and finding the steps to resolve them and so on and it was it was just incredibly exciting so right. I, you know, it was, uh, there was no grand plan that got me on that route. And, and even when I'd done that, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do with it. I, I went to Australia for a while afterwards, did some teaching there, did some coding. Um, and eventually in 1990, I, uh, I came, I was attending SIGGRAPH. Um, actually, it would have been in 1989, I was attending SIGGRAPH in uh, LA and um, I was talking to somebody who needed an assistant professor of art at a small university here, West Coast University. And so they offered me the job and, and <laughs> so I thought, well, why not? <laughs> why not go to this city where I don't know anyone and I've never in my life dreamed of going and why not just start over again? Um, right. So I did, so I, so I ended up moving to California in 1990 and I've been here ever since. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I did the teaching thing for a while and I worked for a theme park design company, um, doing visualizations of rides and so forth for the, for the world's fair in Korea that was in 94. Okay. And then, um, at some point, you know, I, I sort of realized, oh, Los Angeles, oh, Hollywood's in Los Angeles, which I actually seriously did not know when I moved here. <laughs> and there was all this exciting work starting to come out, you know, then I started seeing. Uh -huh. I started seeing Jurassic Park. I started seeing the possibilities there. And so then I was on more of a mission to get my hands on some of the really high-end hardware and software that I, to that right. point I had not uh, not yet had access to. So that was kind of the beginnings that led me towards um, the, the movie part of the business at any rate. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny that you moved to LA and not without the goal of getting into the movie industry. <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Uh, made, well, well, I guess SIGGRAPH in 98 must, must have been really small, or 89, I mean, must no, have been really well, small. Well, it wasn't that small. And my first SIGGRAPH was actually in 88, which was in Atlanta, and I was a student volunteer there. And, okay. and then I think LA was was probably larger. Um, yeah, I think I think SIGGRAPH peaked in about, I think it peaked in 97, actually, which was a big yes. year for me in relation to SIGGRAPH. But it was probably bigger in the late 80s than it is now, is my guess. Yeah, but, it's probably true. It was, a, yeah. it, was, it was the only real conference for anyone in the field. So everybody was, was there. And it, it yeah. was just an incredibly exciting time. It was I just, also... I don't... <laughs> Yeah. It was also the place to get announcements, right? Like people would announce big things at SIGGRAPH, right? Now people don't really announce. They denounce them on the internet. So they, <laughs> they don't bother with going to conferences yeah. to announce things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was true into the 2000s, honestly, that we still relied mm. upon, even, even if there are other ways to get the message out, uh, vendors, uh, uh, artists, all sorts of people, still chose SIGGRAPH as the means to to make those kinds of announcements. And we all managed our calendars around it one way or another. And, and that is no longer. It really is. That's true. Um, That's true. Well, cool. Yeah. Okay. So so what, so you, you got into the film industry. When did you first get into the VFX? Yeah. Well, the, the, in, uh, in 93, I guess it was, I went to work for RFX, who were a reseller of... Yes hardware, software, and they that was an opportunity for me to actually get access to all this stuff that none of us could afford access to unless you actually right. worked for a facility at the time. And that was with Cliff, so, right? 
that was exactly <laughs> um so but actually cliff cliff was a little little later there so it's ray Finney's company and then right. um uh why is his name escaping me now and there's two people with this name in the industry that always get mixed up anyway um okay it was it was a fairly small company actually working out of the same building as as uh as rhythm and hughes at the time um okay. before they moved to their newer location mm-hmm. but anyway in the course of that i was able to learn <laughs> wavefront prisons chaos tools matador uh you know you name it it was it was really what whatever the software was they were selling and i was doing the support for them so i was going into the facilities using the software and actually doing some basic kind of training and and support for them so it was a great foundational way to to get a broad look at the software that was available and i must say i had seen i had seen prisms uh you know the precursor to houdini i'd I'd seen that at sigraph probably the prior year and had looked at it and thought, that's how my mind works. That's that's the best representation of how I think that I've yet seen. And and that had really, you know, that is what convinced me to leave my theme park job and go to RFX and take that path. Right. And then, you know, I'd, I'd uh, gone into Digital Domain to do some prisons training for them. And they were working on a commercial. This was at the end of 93. They were working on a commercial called Jeep Snow Covered, which later won a gold Clio. And, and it... It was uh, a jeep tunneling under the snow in this big desolate snowy landscape, and you just you don't ever see the car, which was a really radical thing at the time to actually have a car commercial with no car in it. Uh, but mm-hmm. it's just this tunneling under the snow and a little stop sign that you can see just peeking out above the snow at the end, and the and the brake lights just sort of glow through it. And uh, so they were trying to work out how to how to take a plate that they'd shot and actually put the digital version of the snow on top of that anyway i went in to do some training on prisms and they had a few issues they were trying to solve about how to do this so i went back to rfx that night and i found a solution and went back the next day and showed them and so they offered me a job nice <laughs> so, i don't think i ever in my life had to make a demo reel you know it was just one of those things that if you're in the right place at the right time right. had some information somebody needed it was enough to get you on the next step um, That's great. and that was the beginning of some very happy, very satisfying, very exciting years at Digital Domain. Yeah, so so this must have been what around ninety four, five or six. Yeah, I, it was. I actually I went in there to do the training at the end of ninety three, and I started with them like the first day of the new year in, in ninety four. So oh, so uh, this, so DD on. must have been mm-hmm. very young at the time. A very young. Young. Company. It was with their second second year of existence. I guess. Right. Yes. I think I had yeah. number. I'm trying to remember if it was number 27 or 37 on my badge. I can't remember. There you go. <laughs> I was going to ask if you remember your badge number. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's interesting. That's cool. So yeah, so yeah, that's why you knew Matthew and and, uh, and Kelly and all those yeah. guys, Yeah, right? these they were all my boys. You know, I was a little bit older than, <laughs> yeah. than most of them. And, and, you know, one time or another, I probably put them all in place as team leads on various shows and, and, right. um, and, worked closely with them over over a number of years and, and have seen them all rise to great success. And right. then here am I. <laughs> <laughs> well, hold on, hold on. You have certainly done some amazing things. Uh, but let's, but what were you, what were your primarily, you know, you were started off as a prisms artist, I guess there, but what were your primary responsibilities at DD? You know how it was then everybody did a bit of everything. Everybody was a generalist. Everybody. And, right. and, and, I was I was no different. It was whatever problems came my way that needed to be solved. Um, but in in general, I suppose I found myself uh, at, at the heart of trying to identify things that could benefit from a defined pipeline, mm-hmm. <laughs> things that needed to be repeated, things that could be made more efficient, ways to transport data from one thing to another. I, I became really fascinated in the whole pipeline from the stage from all of the um, motion control rigs that we used and various, various ways of capturing motion, getting that into the 3D software, that, that representation and how that would let us marry all the CG elements with the, with the plates and so forth. Yeah. So I, there was, I guess if I had a niche, it was that, but it wasn't really, you know, I think on interview with the vampire, I would, I was animating curling hair and on, <laughs> uh, you know, on, 
some other commercial I'd be generating reflections and a car, but it was really was was whatever happened. So it was the best kind of education you can have because every every job, every problem was different from the one you you solved before. Um, right. But I but I I guess I did have a I did have a bit of a knack for identifying. For, for looking beyond the particular shot I was working on and the specific problem I was solving and for seeing the bigger picture of where things could be made more efficient, where, where processes could be defined in a, um, in, in a way that could be shared with multiple people. So, so perhaps because of that, I did end up supervising pretty quickly. And, and um, so then my job really, really was about breaking down the, those those shots, understanding the best processes for getting them done and putting the right teams together to to do that work. Right. And that was very satisfying. Yeah. And I, you know, early or, or late 90s, early 2000s, uh, there weren't that many women supervisors, I don't think, in the visual effects world, were there? <laughs> there were not a lot. Although I think DD was better than most, you know. Uh, yeah. Karen Karen Galikas was already mm-hmm. supervising shows at, at that time. Um, I remember I remember counting it up at some point, and realizing well maybe one in six of the digital artists were female, and then probably about one in six at supervisor levels were as well. So the, right. at least the ratios were consistent, but no, there, there weren't a lot of others. Um, yeah, it was. I I never felt it was. Um, I didn't feel any resistance i didn't feel any lack of support i didn't feel disrespected in in any kind of a way it was uh you know it was a limitation of who was feeding into the system more than the actual environment once you got there uh, so yeah. my own experience was was pretty good <laughs> i could, i i definitely believe that uh i just I definitely believe that it's just a very different, I mean, when I went, when I went to DD, I mean, I walked in there and from, you know, coming from a corporate architecture background, which is what I was doing mm-hmm. before that, then going into DD is like, oh my God, I just walked into a frat house. You know, it was really, <laughs> which was great. Well, <laughs> well you know, absolutely. There was an aspect of that, but I, you know, I liked going down the firehouse with the rest of them. And having sure, a sure, few sure. <laughs> I, mean, I, if I, I think if I had a, had a family at the time, and if I'd been slightly older, if I'd been, I'd, maybe I'd have felt differently. But it suited me at that time of my life, and I just really enjoyed the hell out of it. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think yeah. you know what's also interesting is that you know I, I've known these guys for for many years. I haven't been in working in visual effects in a long time myself, uh, but you know I see Brian Grill all the time, and when I yeah. see him, it's always a huge hug, you know, and it's always mm-hmm. the same thing. And that's it. You know, Brian hasn't worked at Digital Domain for years and years and years, but he's still part of that core group of family almost, you know what I mean? So that's I what know, it feels I feel like. the same way. I could, I could not see people for three, four, five years. And, and yet when I do, I, I just have this real deep, deep fondness for so many of the people I knew from that time. Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> sure, for sure. Okay, so how, how long were you at DD and what were some of your favorite shows that you worked on? <laughs> Okay. Well, I was there. Um, I was there until kind of uh, beginning, I think, of '89, and then actually left for a year, and then came back for another two, two and a bit years. Um, okay. So I, I think probably my favourite show, quite frankly, was Apollo 13 in in every possible way. I mean, I, I loved loved the subject matter. I loved mm-hmm. the research that had to go into to making things look right. I, I loved the the learning process on the show and being given a load more responsibility than I ever expected at the beginning of it. So in, in terms of the overall experience and how I feel about the final product, I think it's got to be um, Apollo 13. And then I think, you know, Titanic was a big deal for me because I actually was, a, was one of two digital effects supervisors on, on that show. So that was a... Uh, a just to have the chance to work on on a film that was, you know, one of the biggest grossing films ever. Well, it, it was <laughs> for a long time, the yeah. and then and mm-hmm. the one of most ever. I, I can't say I loved every minute of the experience of it, but yeah, it's not a bad thing to be able to say I worked on that, and and it was good to have an impact on such a large amount of it. So Mark, Mark Lassoff took on everything relating to the took on the all the digital character work, which meant that I had all the teams who were doing 
all the water stuff, the digital ship, right. the um, uh, all data integration, all of that, you know, from, from the miniatures and, and the uh, full full scale set and integrating all of that. And then the, uh, the the paraphernalia team, which was just the miscellaneous everything else that you, you had to get in Random there. stuff on the ship. Shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and all that sort of stuff. So, so it was really broad scope and it was pretty exciting from that point of view. And then I think Fight Club was was a highlight too because having having done something on the scale of Titanic, it was actually really nice to scale back and just be on a tiny team putting together that opening sequence uh, where it goes through the brain and then and then comes out the hair follicle and down the nose and the end of the gun yep. and um, and I was mostly dealing with that a later portion of the shot and and then. Uh, David Prescott and Dan Lemon were doing the interior, brain interior. So it was just fabulous to focus on one long shot like that with, with just a couple of people and, and get back to being on the box, which I hadn't really had on Titanic, right? We just right. being oh, I still can do that. <laughs> right. So, so you know, there were, there were a lot of great projects there, but I think more than, more than anything, it was the ability to keep, keep growing and keep moving. <laughs> That right. was was so splendid about DB. I never felt put in a box in any way. Um, I mean, I even ended up managing the three D team for a while when we were between projects. So there's always something new to do and new to learn about. Wow. And then I, um, you know, I ended up uh, leaving leaving for a year partly as, as a personal, partly to allow for a personal project to happen. Um, and then when that didn't really happen, I. I came back and said, can I come and work here again, please? And so then they made up a whole other job for me. Nice. <laughs> so at that, at that point, I came back as um, creative director for digital production and technology. And I, I had the software team and the TD team and the digital effects supervisor and so on, all reporting to me and sort of running some uh, cross-disciplinary technology projects within DB. Um, so it was great. It was all all within DD 1.0, and, and yeah. uh, I, you know, I wonder what it would have been like to stick around for twenty five, thirty years, like some of my friends, and see it see it through all those different eras. But I never did experience it beyond beyond that. Um, wow. Yeah. So that took me through to early two thousand three. Yeah. That's, that's that's okay. So two thousand three. I wait a minute. I joined DD in two thousand and two or three i was there on day after tomorrow were you there on day after tomorrow? yeah so i i had a baby okay <laughs> so I, was on, I, think I was probably on maternity leave right <laughs> when you when you started and right. um and in fact it was partly the whole having a baby thing that made me just think ah i i can't keep living the way i've been living <laughs> right Right. There did come a moment where I just thought this this is a little too insane if I'm ever gonna yeah. remember this child's name. Um yeah. <laughs> and so I at that point I looked for a way to stay in the business but not necessarily be in production for a while. And I, I it did seem a little too difficult to reconcile the two things, at least for that period of, of sure. time, you know. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> well that's that's amazing. Uh so so yeah, so we were just barely didn't cross paths at DD. I, I know, I know. I, I, I suspect on the books we did, but like on I the said, books we did, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, your name was spoken quite a bit. I remember people talking about you quite a bit. Eric Hansen, I think, used to speak about you a lot. And, uh, uh, yes, I've worked so. with, with Eric on, on a number of things. Yes, okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> wonderful, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. And I think you know, so so it's really been it's it's you know really cool to see that. Okay, so you had a baby. And you decided you needed a little bit of change of change of scenery. Where did what what happened after that? Oh well, so I was talking to a friend over at Side Effects and said, oh, I think I might be looking to put a change of pace. And she said, Hmm, let me talk to somebody. So uh, it turned out they were looking for somebody with production experience to go in and consult for them with with customers. And the timing was good, you know. So I. I I don't think anyone quite knew what the job would entail, just that the, the timing worked for both of us and they brought me on and I was able to start in a, actually in a part-time capacity and just build the hours over time. So I was, I was a production consultant for a, a number of years with side effects, which was, which is also 
in its own way wonderful just to be able to uh, move beyond knowing one facility intimately and to be able to get an overview of all kinds of different places and go in and visit and see how their pipelines compared and 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 get a get a feel for their culture and so on so so that that was good to be exposed to a whole bunch of different places um and you know i've actually now i mean at this point i've been with side effects for for 19 years in fact yesterday was my 19th anniversary now i'm looking well, at congratulations <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but but i the, the role has evolved over time i mean i generally every every few years if i'm getting a little little itchy little antsy i'd sort of invent a new job for myself so uh i later moved in um became director of the games segment of the business after we we made the case that we should be working with more game developers that um okay. and uh, that needed some oversight so i did that uh, for well officially i did it from i think 2015 to uh 2020 but in reality i was already doing the job for a couple of years before it was named you know uh and then i when my boss retired uh, about a year and a half ago well yeah um I took over as as VP of sales and marketing in an acting capacity for a while. And then just very recently, once they filled that position uh, more permanently, I became VP of strategic partnerships. So that's another evolving role, (laughs) but an exciting one to start. So I do want to... I do want to know what strategic partnership job involves because that sounds very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll work it out while we have this conversation. Yeah, I know. I know. It sounds very <laughs> yeah, exciting. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, so anyway, it's a, it's a meandering course that's just got me further and further away from using any creative software whatsoever. You know, I spend all my time in Google Sheets and Docs and e- emails, so so forth. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, but. Um, so that's, you know, that's that's something that, well, regret is too strong a word, but I, but I, I have, you know, a, a little, a little sense of loss about about having removed that from my professional life, and sure. but I also recognise that, oh my goodness, there's so much you have to know now to be any good, and I was at a certain level once, and I really wanted what didn't want to do it at a lesser level now. You know, right. I remember when you could just learn a piece of software by reading three three ring binders worth of stuff, and you you'd actually learned everything that software had to offer you. At least, at least where all the buttons were, and then you right. could make it do a lot. But now you there's no, <laughs> no. the depth is so extraordinary. You yeah. know, you need to you need to know the scuba dive just to <laughs> even begin to get the, to the depths of a lot of the software, and and that's. That's just not me anymore. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, don't my brain doesn't really work in that kind of focused way anymore. I'm always looking for the bigger patterns and the bigger picture. I think that's uh, a good thing. I feel similarly, <laughs> honestly speaking. I mean, I'm not. I'll, I'll put it. Well, actually, it's interesting. I'll just listen. This, this, you know, this actually dovetails into Houdini a little bit. Mm-hmm. But you know, like for example. You know, I was a mostly a specialist in, in lighting. That was most of what I used to love to do. Obviously really into rendering, really into shaders, materials, and, and trying to make things look real or, or look like the way they needed to look. And that was something I was fascinated by. And then I was always interested in Houdini because I liked how that interface kind of made the nodal interface made a lot of interesting sense. And it was like, you know, Myers didn't have necessarily the best nodal interface that I thought of, you know. But looking at it also at the same time, Houdini artists were like these – Zen gods that would do crazy things out of, you know, out of everything because Houdini just had so much interesting creative, you know, potential. And also I was a math major back in my undergraduate. So I was like, it's very appealing to the math thing, but I never got into it. And what's interesting that's happening now is that Houdini is becoming way more important than the specialist smoke and destruction people, right? (laughs) That's what it was known for. And now it's like, Everyone wants to learn Houdini for like an entire, uh, uh, you know, uh, scene assembly in in a lot of ways, and it's really fascinating with Solaris and USD, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm starting to get really interested, but I'm like I'm intimidated by Houdini. 
at the same time to start learning and learning a new piece of software. I was like, well, should I really learn this? I was like, it's everyone's talking about this and they're thinking it's going to change everything. So I'm fascinated by it. Houdini is the one that scares me, honestly, Judith. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I won't pretend that I wouldn't be scared to pick it up from first principles now. I mean, right. I, I would. It's an undertaking. But I think if you've got a certain kind of problem you want to solve and you're motivated, it's going to get you there and then it's going to feel great. I mean, there, there is that, there is that initial learning curve. I'm not going to deny it, you know, where it's, sure. it's, uh, it's, it's mind bending. I mean, it, it depends too what you bring to it. You having, having used no base software with a mathematical background, certain way of thinking, it's not going to seem peculiar, but there's just a lot of habits that are formed with other software that you have to unlearn. And, and sure. expectations about how you get to the next step that that have to be overcome. And and but I it, it's it's not it's not as intimidating as people think it's going to be. But I'm not going to trivialize it. It's a it's a deep piece of software, and to do yeah. extraordinary things with it, it'll, it takes extraordinary effort. And probably our marketing people at Side Effects would be just trying to gag me right now for saying that. But, you know, it's like anything you you, you learn, you have, you get back what you put into it. And Well, uh, but, its popularity is growing like crazy, <laughs> so I don't think it's necessarily unachievable in a lot of ways. It's certainly not uh, unachievable. Certainly right. not. And, and, and I, you know, there was a time, um, well, again, in the 90s, I suppose, where I'll, I'll admit it felt pretty great to be one of just a few people who were using Prism's Houdini and 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 got it and could do things with it. And that sort of sense of being part of a, an exclusive club was kind of satisfying. Um, but it's much more satisfying to see the kind of adoption that we have in recent years and, and to know that you can talk to somebody and not have to I- explain for five minutes before you can enter into the next phase of the conversation, you know, what, what Houdini is. Have you heard of Houdini? Oh, good. Do you know what node-based software is? Oh, excellent. Do you know, you right. know what, what procedural means? Fantastic. Then right. now we can get on to talking about something interesting. We used to have to explain that for hours on end. <laughs> you know? So this is a much better place to be. And, and I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of that journey that we've, we've seen. And I will well, say that I, I was always adamant that what, what side effects had in its hands wasn't high-end effects i mean it is but that wasn't what was important what was important was was proceduralism and that that's actually the the thing that would sustain the company long term and uh i i think that's being borne out in 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 a lot of ways and in different segments now as well you know going going beyond film and tv work yeah, but you were saying. I mean, yeah, let, uh, <laughs> over I mean, over nineteen years that you've you've been there, obviously. I mean, we can let's get into that a little bit. Like, how how has it changed? How has the, you know, how has the software changed? How has the world changed? How has the effects changed and the artists changed? I mean, lots happened in nineteen years, obviously, with that evolution. Ah, oh, a good question. I think most notably when I started. I would say, as a as a company, we were very insular about the software. There was this sense that the, the the users of the software tended to be large facilities, right? They were they were places that had their own software development teams. There was there was plenty of engineering prowess, and there was kind of an expectation that anyone using our software would be willing to do the work that was required to make it work well with anything else they had in their pipeline. And that we didn't really need to provide those kinds of hooks and interfaces into all of the other typical tools that were in use at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a feeling that uh, it, well, the whole idea of user experience was it hadn't even been articulated, quite frankly. It was just, it's, it, it's difficult to do these difficult things and just get on with it <laughs> there, you know right. there, there was there was not honestly a lot of, of willingness to take on the issue of trying to make the software easier to learn um so i, I would i don't think i'm being unfair if i characterize that the first years i was there as, as being like that so a, a right. lot of the those of us who were in the production consulting kind of roles had a lot to say about that. Um, right. The, so we're making an elite tool. For, we're making an elite tool for people who thought they were elite in a lot of ways, right? <laughs> right. 
and 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 one of one of the first things being that we we really we believe we did have a responsibility to uh to make it easier for for facilities to get our software embedded in pipelines and and particularly if we wanted to be not peripheral to the pipeline but more of the backbone to a lot of different processes we, we really have to have ways of moving data around and communicating in the right ways with with other packages. I mean, it's as simple as just, you know, back then, just at getting getting FBX output added was like major, <laughs> major victory. <laughs> but, you know, ultimately, the, the, obviously that, that paradigm uh, shift went as far as things like uh, Houdini Engine so that you could actually run Houdini processes from within other applications. And, and yeah. so, that that did spread greatly, but yeah, that's so. But I think that's one of the biggest changes I've I've seen in the in the internal thinking and priorities at, at side effects, um, and and uh, you know along with that, the need, need to provide education, the need to proactively go out and make sure there's a lot of good learning materials being created and kept up to date, building out a community who who in the end do a lot of work for us, right? They do a lot of the communication about the successes that they have. They do, they're the ones building uh, little tips and tricks videos that they're putting out on YouTube and, and doing a lot of that, doing a lot of that knowledge sharing for us. So I, I would say that that's been another very healthy development in, in the time that I've been there. Um, and then just, you know, there, there was a reason side effects focused on high end effects for a while and it was, a, it was a very practical reason to do with resourcing and the size of the company and, and not trying to do too many things at once right you've got yeah. to sometimes just focus your efforts even though you know there's another shiny thing over there where we could do some good mm-hmm. <laughs> high end effects was was a was a niche waiting for the taking honestly and so th- there was a there was a level of focus for a period of time that served the company really well but again, later, we, since then, we've been able to expand out into other areas successfully. And, and now I think, uh, I think most people would agree that Houdini is, is, a, is a general use 3D software now. It, it's really not just about effects. And these things take yeah. time. <laughs> they yeah. take time, but we've had it and survived. <laughs> so yeah. That's pretty excellent. yeah. I was talking to, I'm sure you remember Chris Blythe. Uh, of course. But- <laughs> Yeah. But I was talking with him and he says, could you imagine 10 years ago, we would be saying that, you know, the number one growing software and visual effects is Houdini and Blender. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> it's like it just right. doesn't make any sense, but it's, it is the truth. <laughs> um, but I do think that a lot of the reason, the big reason, obviously, I mean, I'm hearing this from a lot of our customers as well, but a big reason I'm hearing a lot of interest in Houdini is obviously Solaris and what's going on with Solaris yeah. and what you guys yeah. are doing there. So, um, Tell me a little bit about that. How did how did the Solaris start, <laughs> and what's the motivation there with that? Well, I think you know a lot of the conversations uh, earlier conversations with Pixar and about what they were doing were very exciting. We're all always all of us looking for a real standard in anything we do, right? So we we had already been thinking about revamping uh, environment for doing layout for doing lighting some some. Uh, some ideas in the works about rendering and so on. But there was Pixar in a position to really make USD uh, stick. Really, really make, that if anyone could persuade the community that this was a thing we had to do as a whole in the community, you know, Pixar, Pixar were well positioned to do that. So we just got on board with them very early. Um, and the decision was made to to make USD you know, native into Houdini. This is not just some sort of translation layer happening on top of what we already had there, but a whole new context that was that was going to be native. And, um, you know, at the same time, there was, there was a general building of a community and, and an alliance with pe- people saying, yes, we're interested in that. We're, we're paying attention. <laughs> we, we're not sure where the tipping point is. We're not sure we're ready yet, but we are paying attention. So I think the, the idea that we could be one of the first to really substantially commit some resources to that in a in a non-proprietary context was was really important too uh so you know at the timing was good we 
we wanted to make that push in, into a space that's got, I mean, there's, there's a hell of a lot more lighting layout of dev artists out there than there are effects artists, right? You want to grow, you've got to grow into another area. It seemed like the right one to go in for us and the timing was very good in terms of the relationship with Pixar. And we, we've been working with closely for a number of years anyway, but this, this, was, uh, this was the moment to deepen that relationship. And we're seeing great adoption. Um, it's 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 a really interesting time for <laughs> for USD because it's it is as close to a standard as any of us can hope for right now. And and yet I'm I'm already hearing little whisperings about well, so and so is implementing this other schema, and I don't think that's really taking into account what these people over here are going to need. And and so there's still already a little bit of concern that there'll be some fracturing going on. Yep. Um, and some, you know, some need to have some sort of organization like the Academy Software Foundation or something actually, actually come in and say, Clamping down. <laughs> Let's talk about this, guys. <laughs> but then you've got uh -huh. the game studios who perhaps aren't quite as much part of that saying, well, we're interested in USD too, and we wouldn't be using it in exactly the same way you will. So it's, there's, a, there's a lot of dynamics there, a lot of things still shifting. And, and uh, well, we'll just continue to be part of that conversation and try to accommodate whatever the conclusions are. It's, but, I, yeah. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's great that you guys are doing that. And I think that, you know, USD is, is very, very interesting. It's much more than FBX obviously ever was, but, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and we needed to get away from a file <laughs> format that was invented for motion capture <laughs> and still used for other general purposes. But USD is, what I think is fascinating about the way that you guys did USD is that you really embraced what it, its potential was, and it's not just a way of translating data from one application to another. You're actually looking at it as a native format, and that is really powerful. And I find that some other uh, pieces of software are very reluctant to do that because they want to stay you to stay in their little walled garden, and they don't necessarily want to, you to be able to 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 openly just like, if you support USD, you should be able to do this with everything. And you guys should sort of embrace mm -hmm. that. And you did planted your flag, as you say, uh, <laughs> in there. And I think that that's really the sign of success that you're going to be able to make that work, which is great for, uh, for you know, for rendering purposes. It's I'm happy to, as long as we can support USD and Hydra, yes. we can be part of that yes. conversation, <laughs> you know? Exactly. I mean, we've, we've, and, and when it comes to rendering, we've, we've always, been in the play nicely with others kind of category there yeah. and and you know when we've always, we've had mantra forever but random man was deeply integrated from very early on we you know we, we've <laughs> we've got plenty of people using v-ray we've had plenty of people using redshift we've had plenty of, it, it, it's it's really been something that we've uh I mean, perhaps that was our first play with others nicely lesson, right? The back beyond the time when we were much more sort of insular, probably rendering was the first place where we did sort of open up um, a lot more. And yeah, I love I love to see that continue with with, with USD. And I think you know, it, it's survival for all of us to to work with all the other packages. I don't think anyone can, anyone can afford to just say I'm going to do it my way and damn you all. <laughs> Yeah, it yeah, work that way. for sure. Now that this does bring up an, this, you know, because you're saying playing nicely with others and everything. Well, let's talk a little bit about <laughs> your role as with as strategic partnerships. Like, what what does that mean, and how does that ah. does that tie into that? <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, in part, this role has come about because we, over the years, we have developed a lot of different partnerships, um, but not all partnerships are made equal. And mm -hmm. not all are necessarily maintained on the level they need to be. I mean, to, to some extent, the role exists because we have a we we need to more actively manage a lot of those relationships we already have with a lot of entities. But we also know that there's certain certain existing partnerships and certain that certain ones that perhaps don't exist yet that deserve uh, a much deeper, much more long term plan and and some more formal arrangements whereby we help one another in our in our businesses um so you know my literally just starting this job but the, my first job really is to review who are all the people we've been working with already and can we do it better uh but at the, at the same time we've already got some some relationships with with 
with companies like like Epic Games and, and like uh, Unity, um, you know, where I think we're already in a little bit deeper, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, with with Epic, um, you know, they have they have some investment in side effects, although they're very very non controlling, you know. But sure. but they have an we have a mutual interest in 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 many many shared customers and. Um, a lot of things we can do together that that elevate one another. And with with Unity, in, in the past, we've been part of their verified solutions, and and we've uh, worked with them early on doing the, the games development. We were working with them on the Houdini Engine plugin actually before we were Unreal. So at various times, sure. we've had a very close relationship with Unity, and um, and so. So the partnerships is really about finding those places where we can we can get mutual mutual benefits from working more closely. And I think, you know, although Side Effects is very much focused on media and entertainment, we're still not a massive company, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we're very much focused on that. But there's, there's I'm also obviously very much aware that there are things you can do with our software in other in other segments um, that show a lot of promise. And we've always had some percentage of customers outside media and entertainment. I mean, if you look at things like autonomous vehicles, for example, you know, there's there's a, there's a lot of companies using machine learning to generate, uh, they're using Houdini to generate a lot of training data, for example, for, for machine learning, or um, or you've got visualization, medical visualization, architectural mm-hmm. visualization, and so on. So there's there's some other there's some other segments where. We don't, we don't want to distract from the main part of our business, but I think there's some interesting potential to follow up on there as well. So you'll have to ask me again in a year and we'll see. <laughs> well, I am curious. Uh, I am curious. I mean, I, I've, I mean, there is a lot of things that are happening right now in, in, in the world and in the computer graphics world more specifically. Uh, you know, I was last week, I was at the NFT LA conference trying to figure out mm. what's going on over there, right? Oh, and please sort of, tell me. Oh, that's <laughs> another thing I can't figure out. <laughs> I, I'm writing a report about it to my, uh, to, to, to the guys, uh, to some of the, the vice presidents at, at Chaos, and it's, it's already like 3,000 words. It's a lot, just so much is going on, which is crazy. <laughs> but there is, you know, what is, what are your thoughts about that? Obviously now, you know, there, the, People are thinking about content in a different way. People are not just thinking about media and entertainment and movies. They're thinking about the metaverse. They're thinking about game engines. They're thinking about all of those things. And, you know, you guys, like you said, used to be this little specialist company that made the best explosions and destructions out there. And now you've grown into (laughs) this different world and this different idea. And I think it's interesting to, uh, to, to think about what you guys are thinking about in terms of creating things for that 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 universe what are your thoughts on that yeah yeah i mean we we're still very much we're still very much about creating the technology that other people will use to create the things for you know for web 3d for the metaverse for whatever whatever it is um but but i will say that we we see, we see how essential real time is, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, and what that means for us is something that we're we're still we're still coming to terms with. Um, we, you know, we've we've done well on the Houdini engine side in terms of giving people a way to create content and to iterate on content as close to to gameplay as as close to real time as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so very much when we when we were starting the game segment there, and we were moving into Houdini, Houdini Engine, it was always about accommodating that need for the the game developers to 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 keep iterating as long as possible, and to, and to do that in such a way that they were uh, if, if they were right at the point where they were doing a, a build for the game. So, in, in terms of our relationship to, to real time, we're, we're in a decent place there. I mean, there's always more we can do to evolve the functionality of Houdini Engine, but that's that. But there's always been a lot of questions about, well, how can we, we be more truly runtime? And this is something that <laughs> we've talked about for years, you know, the, the idea of, of doing some sort of um, something that can really, some version of Houdini or whatever that can really 
execute real time runtime and you know could be distributed with a console or whatever quite frankly that's not something we we're, we're particularly after i mean the, the 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 demands the technical demands of doing that are i don't know if they're insurmountable but they're just not not yeah. something that we would want to try and, and we resource. should be clear However, we're not just talking we're not talking just about lighting <laughs> we're talking about cloth sim in real time and things exactly. of that yeah. yeah yeah and there there are there are people doing that i mean these well don't get me talking about nvidia but yeah yeah there's people right. do, doing this this stuff in with these amazing modules and i i just i don't see that we should should even try to go there frankly but don't take just my word you can you can interview other people and they can tell you different sure. things but but i do think what's interesting is the notion of just in time delivery to devices that are running something real time so marrying um houdini engine on the cloud with delivery onto a phone or or tablet or something that does get interesting and that's um, it, you know being being able to um look at some kind of service where you you can ask houdini engine to deliver back some relevant content uh on on a device other than your computer <laughs> you know, right. um is is an area that would be uh that would have us be part of the all those conversations you were talking about, you know, all all of these right. new sort of delivery systems, all of these new sort of ways of, of looking at media and and so on. So, cloud is is cloud in general, and the idea of a service on the on the cloud, um, without getting too specific about what form that can take, that's absolutely uh, something that's in, of interest to us. I hope that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does. Well, I'm not being terribly specific. <laughs> no, I, you, yeah. you, I, that's fine. Yeah. I understand where you're getting at. But uh, yes, absolutely. I think it's interesting because Houdini does, you know, some of the, a lot of the things you guys are c- calculating are computationally intense, and you're basically trying to find a way to deliver that to the masses at a in a way that makes sense. Well, you right? know, e- EA did an interesting thing a few years back with their um, with. Uh, NBA Live, they had uh, um, an app on the on the phone, so that people could scan scan their faces, right? And that uploaded to a server. Houdini Engine then got used to to do some mapping and decimation and and deliver up the the actual asset, so that when they then went back to the console to play the game, it was their face in the game. Right. Uh, so you know that is that is one. That is that is an early use case of the kind of thing I'm talking about, but perhaps that's not pretty cool. as immediate as I would like to see. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, I think there's something fascinating about you know Houdini Engine because it's like a little mini custom made Houdini just for you to do some specific thing, right, or whatever you want it to to be. Which I think is a fascinating exercise in terms of what it is. It's like, oh, let's just take just this part and then give it a nice interface and then boom. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, and I think, you know, there's, there's the potential to, to layer on an even nicer face, interface, a more abstract sure. idea, a completely different way of interacting on top right. of the usual stuff that Houdini provides. So I think you can start to abstract some of that a little bit more. The applications open way, way wider. Yeah, and can you could you make a web interface for Houdini Engine? I guess you could, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, you you already yes is the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes is the short answer. Okay, that's really cool. That means that basically you could use Houdini Engine to power all kinds of websites and all kinds of different things, which is really kind of incredible. Um, well, that is really really amazing. Uh, I'm I'm fascinated by by what you guys are doing. Uh, would love to lear, learn more, obviously, uh, because I know you guys are always doing things, and I'm really excited about what you guys are doing. Uh, not only am I excited about what you guys are doing with Solaris, but I know a lot of my customers are very excited about what you guys are doing with Solaris. So I'm happy uh, to be sort of been exploring USDs and what you guys are doing for a long time. Um, and, you know, happy to try to make sure that we deliver some of those things and working closely with you guys to do it. So Fantastic. very, very exciting. Uh, but Judith, me, thank you so much for being on and for being able to share all these amazing stories and, and going back to the early days of digital domain, which has obviously been on the topic on the show a few times, but it's always great to hear it from your perspective and see what you're doing. Uh, I've always been fascinated by you, so I'm really glad we finally able to talk. <laughs> 
It's very fun. I don't think anyone's asked me that many questions about my opinions on anything ever. This time, <laughs> it's exhausting. <laughs> um, so hopefully it wasn't too exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Chris.